Okay, so yeah, welcome back everybody for part three of our Zero to Shiro uh, series. We're going to be talking about data wrangling today, talking a lot about dplyr, uh, and I think it's going to be a good, a good session. So thanks for joining us again. So without further ado, let's jump back into the tidyverse. We have the link for all the materials we sent it around in the chat, and it's also on our yeah, in the meetup page. So you should be able to have this file. And yeah, let's get started with um, a little recap of last time. So last time we covered uh, tidy data with Tidyverse, and we're going to keep going in a pretty similar vein this time. So to get started, make sure you load your Tidyverse package here. We're going to load in the data that we used in the previous time, which is this IKEA data. It's IKEA Saudi Arabia, and it has all the name of all the items that um, are in stock there. It has information like price and colors, description. We'll see that a little bit more as we start working with it. And this time, we're going to introduce another data set, which we're going to primarily use in the exercises, which is just going to be yeah, just something different that we could try out. And this is movies data, and it was Tiny Tuesday data last week or the week before. So it's a pretty recent data set, and it includes a lot of information about movies. So there's the title of the movies. They have like the identifiers where you find them on IMDb, which is the internet movie database, and just some info like the year and um, the budget and so on. And this is this data is related to or it's been um, analyzed in the style of the Bechtel test, which if you may have heard of it, but it's, it's a test which test which looks at like the representation of women in movies. So um, there's a little bit more information about this in the exercises, but basically it just looks at, are there multiple women in the movie? Do they talk to each other? And do they talk to each other about something other than men? This comes from like a comic that was done in, I believe like in the eighties that uh, talked about women's representation in film. So we'll look at that a little bit more in the exercises, but just a little preview of what's coming up. Uh, yeah, so last time we talked about tidy data. If you remember, tidy data is just a standard way of presenting your data or organizing your data in a, in a format that will work well with wrangling, visualization, lots of tidyverse commands, and all sorts of statistical modeling commands that you'll do later. And the principle of tidy data tidy data is that each variable is one column. So you have something like name or color, but you don't have anything that would have like two um, variables in the same column. Also, each observation is a single row. So you won't have, for example, data about multiple participants on the same row or multiple countries, whatever your observation is. And each cell is a single measurement. So that's uh, what we sort of focused on last time. And we covered some commands that use the pipe. The pipe, again, is this uh, symbol with the two percent signs and the little greater than sign in the middle that looks a bit like an arrow. And you can keyboard short shortcut this with Control Shift M. Basically, all this does is it takes whatever's in front of the pipe and it feeds it as the first argument to the following command. And because tidyverse always has the data set as the first argument, you can use this to like chain commands together, which we'll do today. So just to remind you, if you look at like the head command um, using the argument n equals three, then you'll see the first three rows of the IKEA data set. And you can do this the exact same way by just piping the IKEA data set to the head command. So here we have IKEA and then the pipe and the head command. And you can see it does the same thing. So we'll use that in our other tidyverse commands like rename, um, rename, renames as you would expect. So you have here the column price. And if we wanted to call that price SAR for um, Saudi reals, then we could rename that column to price underscore SAR. And if we did this, like here you can see, you always give the new name and then equals to in the old name. So the old column is called price and the new column should be called price SAR. And the old column is called short description, the new column should be called description. So that's how rename works. We also looked last time at relocate, which moves columns around. 
And all this does is takes the columns that you give it and puts them in the first position by default. So here you'd have category as your first column and then name as your second column. Let's relocate. And you can also use like dot after or dot before to um, specify a location for the column that's not in the first position. So if you wanted name to come after old price, you could do dot before or dot after equals old price. And you can also use where to pull up certain types. So you could say like um, relocate where is character and then it will pull all the character columns to the front. If that's something that um, you want to recap on, you can look at that, what we talked about that about that last time, or you can look in the function documentation for relocate. Something else we covered last time was arrange, which just orders the values within a column. So if we arrange name, it will order all of the rows in alphabetical order by name. You can also use descending by wrapping the column name in BESC. And then you'll get from largest to smallest. So here we'll get the price from the highest price to the lowest price ordered. And you can also even give it more than one column. So if you arrange by category and then name, it will first alphabetize by category and then it will alphabetize by name. So it alphabetizes with characters and um, factors and it uses numeric order for, for numbers. Another thing we did last time, continuing on our recap here, was using select, which will pull out just specific columns. So if we select category and price, then our data set will just return those two columns. And we also saw last time how we could use this to pull out certain values from a column. So you could select only the price column. And if you want the minimum value from that, you could pipe that on to min. And you would get the minimum value from that column. We also saw last time how we could use select to drop columns. So you can use select minus and then a column name, or if you want to do more than one column, then you wrap them in this um, vector syntax, so C, just to tell R that the minus applies to everything. So you want to drop both of these columns. And here we're just previewing, but if you wanted to save this, keep in mind that you would have to save it back to your data set. So I won't do that right now. And we saw some helper functions also for select, like starts with, ends with, contains. We talked very briefly about range, num range, and matches, which will allow you to do a little bit more advanced stuff if that's what you need to do. So you can see that if you do like select, contains, underscore, it'll pull out all the columns that contain an underscore. Um, another thing that we talked about was filter. So we really covered a lot last time. Um, filter, which is a really, useful core part of the tidyverse, which allows you to give conditions. And we talked about how you could use equals to with a double equal sign, you could use not equals to, you could do things like greater than or less than or in. So for example, if you filter that the category is equal to beds, again, using the double equals because we're testing if it's equal to beds, then you'll pull out all of the rows where the category reads beds. Same, like you can filter the price above 8,500 and that will pull up the price above 8,500. And we showed you this in for selecting multiple things. So if you want anything, any row where the name is either Brimness, Billy or Calyx, you can use this in syntax. And we also talked about how you can chain these together with and or or, and then you can do that to have multiple conditions in the same filter command. So here we have the categories, tables, and chairs, or chairs, tables, and desks, and the price is less than 1,000. OK, the final thing to recap here is separate and unite. And separate um, is what, what you use when you have one column that has two variables in it. Or it could even be more than two variables. But here we have an example with three. So for this, we're going to look at this movies data set again. Um, they have a genre column, but it has more than one genre in it. So it's a little bit difficult to, to work with that data because you know, if you're looking for comedy movies, you can't just say, OK, the genre has to be comedy because comedy might be in a list of three. 
So here we have like multiple. And what we want to do maybe, or what might be a step for us here, would be to split this into three columns, where each column contains only one genre. And then if there's more than one column, then like the other columns would also have a genre in them. And you can see that it's separated by a comma. So we can use um, separate in the separate function, and we know that our separator is a comma. So we can have the column um, that we want to separate is genre. That's the first argument. Then the second argument is into, which is where you give what you want your new columns to be called. So we want to separate this into three columns called genre run one, genre two, and genre three. So we put that in the into argument um, as an array vector. And we know that the separator that's in the data right now is a comma. So the separator is called the comma. So if we run that, then it's going to give us this warning because as you saw that not all of the genre columns had three in them. So some of them only had two or only had one, in which case they had to introduce an NA into those, um, those new columns. But now if we look over in the genre columns, we now have three columns that have just one genre each. And we also learned the partner to separate, which is unite, which will put columns back together. This would be used like if you had a data set where you had multiple, you had like one observation or one, one variable somehow in two columns, then you would use unite. But here we're just using it to show this as an example, which isn't exactly tidy. If you wanted to have like a long description column for our IKEA data set where you had the name and the description, you could unite the um, new column long description by uniting the columns name and short description and giving a separator for that. So you can see the first argument here is the name of the new column, long description. And then the two things that are supposed to be united were the name and short description columns that existed before. And you want them separated by a colon and a space so that you get like the name, whatever's in the name column, colon space, and then whatever is in the short description column. Just as an example of how you could use unite. Great, so let's talk about mutate. So mutate is one of my most used commands of the tidyverse probably, because you can use it to make new columns and you can also use it to make Calculate, make calculations to existing columns. So syntax for mutate is always the data set first. So we're going to write it this way, where you pipe in the data set directly to mutate. And then you have the column name. And then you have the operation to that column. So you have the operation and the column. And you can do this to make new columns or to update existing columns, which you'll see. So here we have our little um, picture by Allison Horst that shows the mutate adding columns to your data set. So we have this IKEA data set and um, it has the price for all of the items in Saudi Rials. And so I looked it up and a Saudi Rial is equal to about 22 cents in Euro. So say we wanted to make a new column where we have all the prices in Euros so that we can more easily understand what the price is. Then we can take the the whatever data is currently in the price column, which would be in reals. And we can multiply that by 0.2, right? To get the price in euros. So if we want to make a new column called price euro, then we can have the new column name here. And it's equal to the price times 0 0.22. So if we run that, then you'll see we still have the price column. And whatever's in this column um, right now, which is the old currency, then we now have the accompanying price in euros as a new column. So that's a way that mutate takes the value from that row in a certain column and can do something to it and put that value in this new column. So let's save that to make sure that that gets permanently in our data frame. And um, you can also directly work with that column. So if we just have the data frame, we make this new euro column column, we can also select it and look at it. So even if it's not yet saved and you're just looking at the preview, you can continue to work with it. Like you have here, the summary call, and you can just see what the prices are like 
uh, in this summary of that column. So basically, you can save it back to the data frame, or you can keep on working with it in this tidyverse pipe flow uh, in any way that you need to work with it. So that one is a new column, right? That has a new name called price euro, which is in a column that didn't exist before we made it. But you can also uh, update the items in a certain column and kind of save that new version over top of the column. And this is what you want to do if you want to update all the values in a column in a, in a consistent way. So say IKEA has a price increase and they are charging 100 uh, reals more for every item. Then we could take the price column, which exists, and assign it, assign over it um, the price plus 100. So if we take a look at uh, just the data set before, you can see that we have prices like 265 and 995. And then if we run this entire line, then you'll see that they get updated to like 365 and 1095. So all we've done here is we've made, we've used mutate like we did before, but we're assigning it back onto the column that already exists instead of giving it a new name. And then that way we update a column that already, that already exists. So we've seen that you can do things like adding or multiplying, but you can also use a wide variety of commands. So a very wide variety of commands to do certain manipulations to the column. So this is command called to lower. And all that does is it um, takes a text inside of the, <laughs> inside of the, whatever you give it, and it just puts it in lowercase. Okay, so if I feed it here, uh, Kyla, then it gives me Kyla in lowercase. So we can also do that, say we don't like this uh, totally caps <laughs> situation here where the names are all written in caps. Then we can use mutate. We can say we want name and we want to lower applied to the name. So the name is in lowercase. And we can save that back on top of the name column and it's gonna update the name column. So if we do this, then we're now gonna have names that are all written in lowercase. And um, so a similar example to that would also be ncare. All that does is counts the number of characters that are within a string in the bracket. So if we take the number of characters in tidyverse, it just returns a number. So there's nine, nine characters in tidyverse. And uh, if we did that here, we could take the number of characters in the name and say we want to assign this to a new column called name length. Then we can give that on the left side of the equal sign. And this is going to make a column that calculates the length of the item name. So if you take a quick look about how long these words are, the column is at the end. And it will tell you the, the length of the name. So basically, you can use a, a lot of different commands that would work. If it would work on a single value in that column, then it will probably work and mutate to apply that, that operation to every single cell in that column. And you don't, you can do this like in multiple mutate commands, but you can also, if you want to make more than one column, you can do them all in one command with just adding a comma. So this is the euro price column that we made above. And that's uh, price, the new column price euro should be the value in price times point 0 0.22. And we can just put a comma here. We drop down a line by convention just to make it easier to read. And then we could, for example, make our lowercase name column and we can make our length column. And we can do all of those at once and it will do all of those at the same time. So here it's made the name column lowercase and it's added our two new columns of price zero and name length. So just to keep in mind that you can do multiple new or update, updated columns in the same mutate command. And there's something similar, which is uh, in my experience, a little bit less widely used or widely useful and that would be transmute. And basically transmute works exactly the same as mutate except for it drops any columns except for the new columns. So if we do the same thing with transmute here, then we'll only have our new or updated columns and the other columns are totally gone, but they're, they're totally gone. So if you save this over the IKEA data frame, you wouldn't be able to access the old, the old columns that are not here either. So that's only if you want to 
keep only the columns that you've changed. Now, one use case for mutate is updating data types. So we talked either last time or time before or both times a little bit about factors and characters. So character columns are just when R realizes that the column includes text and it just assigns us to a character column. And factor is when R realizes that this is not just like a text label, but it's actually groupings that repeat and that each row belongs to one of the groups. So instead of, for example, a column that includes an item description, which would be unique for each item and it would be um, not, not a grouping type of a situation, a uh, factor would be more like something like um, nationality. So is this person from the US or the UK? So where well, you would have groupings where you would have multiple items in each in each of those groups. So we can do that with mutate by um, using as factor. So we can just do category equals as factor category and other colors equals as factor other colors. And actually I will go ahead and just save this directly because you won't be able to really see it in the preview. But if we run this line, then over here in our environment, we now see that the category column says that it's a factor with a certain amount of levels. So the category is now factor with 17 levels, which means that R knows that that's, that has 17 categories that the items could fall into. And other colors has two levels because it's just a no or a yes. So we had done this last time with a little bit more clunky traditional syntax, but you can also do it within a mutate call. Um, and you can do this as factor. You could also convert to other things like log if you need to convert something to a logical. You can use mutate, same column name, and update it by calling as factor, as character, as numeric. And once we have factors, we like we know that that means that we're working with categories and we have different kind of like bins that have different labels on them, like UK or US or maybe yes or no other colors. And so once we have that, we might want to, there's a couple of things that we can do to those factors. So one thing we can do is we can relabel them. And that would just be giving different names. So let's take a look right now in category, we have stuff like chest of drawers and drawer units. Like that's a very long category and it's not really easy for us to work with, right? Because every time we want to look for that, we have to type up out oh, chest of drawers and drawer unit and so on. There's a couple of these that are really long, like sideboards, buffets, and console tables. So that's pretty long. So say we want to clean that up a little bit, we can actually use this command called recode. And most of the time you're going to recode um, and then save it back to the same column. So in the IKEA category, if we um, mutate the category column and save it over the category column, then we can call recode. The first, uh, the first argument is the column that you want to recode. And then you can give the old name. So the really long old name is equal to what the new name should be. And this old name is equal to what the new name should be. So this is a little bit, this trips me up sometimes because um, on rename and a lot of the tidyverse commands like mutate, you always have the new name to the left. And with recode, you have the new name to the right. So this is the old name and this is the new name. If you forget that, you'll just get like a small error that will say, for example, it can't find drawers or that drawers doesn't exist. And if you, so if you notice something like that, just check to make sure that you have like old label is equal to new label. But let's just run this so you can see what it looks like. I'm going to wrap it in um, parentheses so it prints an output. And now we have category. Actually, let's look at this again, the distinct lay layers, levels. Now we have like drawers instead of all of those uh, chest of drawers and drawers units and book bookcases and shelves. We've just uh, shortened a little bit. So this is helpful if you have different groupings that have like really long and descriptive names that are maybe good for taking a look at the data, but aren't really that helpful for actually working with and manipulating the data. Then you use recode.
So yeah. And um, yeah, you might have to use quotation marks. So if you if you find that it doesn't work when you're writing, if you're doing something with numbers, then just try wrapping the numbers in quotation marks, and that will probably work because it will be read as like a factor level and not as a number. Okay, and the final thing before we try this out is something else you can do with factors, which is collapsing levels. And that would be like if you have too many, like too much detail in the data and you don't really need to work with that much detail. So say you have, um, again, this example of like nationality and you had UK, but you had like England and Ireland and Wales, and you just wanted to collapse all of those together and just call it UK. because Maybe there's like a bit too much detail there that you don't need. Then you can use um, factor collapse. And again, you do this within a mutate call because you're updating the category column. So mutate category, so mutate in place on top of category by collapsing the category column. And again, you give the new label is equal to all of the old labels that you want to now have that new label. So we want bedroom to be anything in this vector. So beds, wardrobes, chest of drawers, and drawer units, um, which actually we have now renamed drawers. Let's update that. Um, yeah. And then say we want children's room to have children's furniture, nursery furniture, then we can give that new label to anything in this, this vector. So when we run this, you would see that um, the categories, there have, there's less categories now. So let's go ahead and save that and look at the distinct categories. And you'll see that we now have children's room and we have bedroom. So we just have a little bit less detail. So that's what you can use to just reduce the amount of levels that you have. So now like for something that really can upgrade your mutate functions and make them really useful, that would be using if else statements. So if else statements are logical, like simple logical statements that a lot of, it's the basis of a lot of um, programming. Basically, if you give it a condition and if it's true, one thing happens and if it's false, something else happens. So when you use this together with mutate, then you can say, you're making a new column and depending on a condition, you want like a different label in that column. So for example, we have the price column now and in this Ikea, we're working with the Ikea data. So we have the price column and say we wanna make like a categorical column for price that just says if something is expensive or it's not expensive, then we can mutate um, the, let's look at this part first, the price column and we can say mutate, we want a new column called price categorical. And we want that equal to this if else statement. And this if else statement says, if the price is greater than 2,000, uh, 2, then the label should be expensive. And if it is not greater than 2,000, then the label should be not expensive. So that fills, uh, that goes through line by line and every line it checks if the price is greater than 2,000. And if it is, then it fills the price categorical column with expensive. And if it's not, it fills it with not expensive. Um, so let's look at just the name, the price and the price categorical. And you can see that it goes through and it finds a number less than 2000, so it fills it with not expensive. And when it finds a number that's greater than 2000, it fills it with expensive. So that's the base use of how you use if else together with mutate. And the conditions that can go in here are pretty much the same as the ones we saw with filter last week and in our little recap today. Um, that was with a numeric column, but you can also do it pretty much with anything that you could put into a filter command. So let's say what, what we want our condition to be is that the item is sellable online. So sellable online is true and other colors is yes. That's the same as what we would put exactly in a filter condition, right? So sellable online equal equal true and sign other colors equal equal yes. So if we use that as the condition for our if else command, 
And then first we give what the label should be if this condition or these conditions are true, that would be available. Or if it's not true, we want the label to be not available. And we want this to be saved to the new column colors underscore online. And so we can do that condition, uh, we can do that. The rest of the code here changes it to a factor and just pulls out those columns. But if that looks confusing, you can also not use that. And you'll see that all it's doing is creating a new column called colors online. And it's just filled with not available if syllable online is not equal to true or the other colors is not equal to yes. But if both these two things are, are true, so both of these conditions are met, then it fills it with available. So basically anything you can use in a filter command can also be used in an if else command. And you can see here, this syntax is totally based around condition, what to do if it's true, what to do if it's not true. It's kind of limited to one condition or testing one, one statement. There can be two conditions, but they have to have like an and or an or and having two options for it. You can stack these up and make a complicated if else chain, but it's also uh, an option to use case when if you have several conditions. So if else is great for just having two conditions, but case when is used for multiple conditions. And basically the syntax of case when, it looks different from if else because it has these little squiggles, which I believe are called tildes. And you always give the condition and then what to do if that is true. And you can do as many conditions as you want. And then you always end it with just true and the squiggle and what to do in all the other cases. And this might not immediately make sense, but if you think about it, it's, it is logical. So first it checks the, the first condition and if it's true, it does what's on the right of the squiggle. And then it checks the next condition. If that's true, it does what's on the right of the squiggle and it goes on and on and on until it hits true. And true is always true. So that always is a yes. So then what's on the right of that squiggle will happen. So it's always testing to see if the conditions are true. And the final one has to be true because you've told it it's true. So that's where you put what to do in all other cases. Let's take a look at that. So um, I just want to show you the, the one mutate command. So if we mutate oops, um, a new column called price cat for categorical again, and we use case when, then we can check if the price is less than or equal to 100, we want the label super cheap. If the price is less than 100 and, or sorry, greater than 100 and less than 500, then we want cheap. If it's greater than or equal to 1000 and less than or equal to 1400, we want pretty expensive. If it's greater than 1400, we want expensive. And for anything else we want average, so you can see there's like a gap here between 500 and 1,000. That's going to be the thing that is caught by average. But basically with case when you can use any number of conditions and you just give your condition, a little squiggle, and then what you want filled in if that is true. And you always end it with true to give what to call it if none of the others are true. Yeah. So if we run this, you'll see, and let's just look at the um, name, the price and the price categorical, then you'll see that it's gone through and it checks which of these conditions is true. So for 265, it first che checks if it's less than or equal to 100. It's not, so then it checks this one, that's true. So it, it fills it in with cheap. And for average, it goes through all four of these conditions. None of them are true. And then it lands on true, which is kind of our catch all, and then it fills it in with average. So this does the same thing as if else, but it's easier to work with multiple conditions. With if else, we could have we only had like expensive and not expensive, right? And we only had one condition. Um yeah, if you didn't have this true, then you would get an NA if you had something that 
um, if you had something that wasn't caught by any of your conditions. So here, if you had the same look, so we, so all we've done here is taken away this true condition at the end. See, we just have our conditions. Then this one, which doesn't fit in any condition, just gets an NA. So you could do it without without a true condition, but it's kind of it might be good to have it there if you want to catch everything. Otherwise, you'll get NAs to anything that doesn't doesn't register as true for any of these conditions. So let's try again um, another just one more example. Let's look at the dimensions of the furniture. So we want to find out which of the three dimensions is the largest. So is the thing um, have the largest dimension in depth, height, or width? So say we want to call this a new column called biggest dimension. We always start with mutate, the column name, new column name, and then we give it case when logic. So if the depth is greater than the height and the depth is greater than the width, then we want depth. If the height is greater than the depth and the height is greater than the width, we want height. If width is the bigger than the other two, we want width. And if none of these are true, we're gonna go with unclear. This is like our default condition there. So now if we look at this, you can see that it's gone through and it's checked which one is the biggest. And if it has any issues, like for example, an NA can't be larger than something else, then it just returns unclear. But basically, again, all we've done is given conditions and they look like anything you could have put in a filter command. So they can have ands or ors, they can use greater than, they can use the double equals. Basically, whenever that gets triggered as true, then whatever's on the right of the squiggle will be filled in as the label for whatever column you've given here. So this can take a little while to wrap your head around or to play around with, but I think once you get used to it, this is a really powerful um, part of the tidyverse universe that can help you make and edit your columns in a cool way. All right. So um, the second big topic is also a really commonly used and really useful um, tidyverse command. So we'll talk about summaries next, and we'll introduce first the summarize command. Um, so this is what we can use if we want some more information, some summaries on um, a variable. So we'll have a look again at the IKEA data um, and just at the price. Uh, so let's say we want to see the average price. Uh, what we can do is we can use summarize. And here I should point out, it doesn't matter how you spell it. So it, uh, it doesn't matter if you have a, an S or a Z, right? They should both uh, work. R shouldn't uh, discriminate between uh, British and American uh, spelling here. Uh, so we're piping into the, the data frame and then we're using summarize. And then the way that summarize works is you you need some kind of summary operation. So do you want the mean, for example? Do you want the max or so the highest value? Um, and we'll show you the options um, later, but we'll just stick with a couple of simple examples. So uh, we would like the mean and we would like the, the mean of the price um, column. So the average price. Okay, here we go. So now it's show, showing us the mean uh, price here. And again, we can do this with uh, the median, for example, same uh, structure, really, we're piping in the data using summarize, and then instead of mean, we're using median. And same with uh, min for the lowest value, so just uh, three uh, reals, and, and max for the highest value in this price column. Okay, so let's try to do that for height. So instead of price, we now have height in these brackets. And you can see that R doesn't give us an error message, but it also gives us an output that doesn't really help us. So that doesn't really seem to make sense. It gives us NA. And the reason for that is that we have some NAs in these columns. So if I scroll all the way over here, you can see these dimension columns have some NA, so missing values. For some pieces of furniture, it might not make sense to have a depth um, dimension if it's just a picture that you put on, put on the wall, for example. Um, right, so there are some NAs, and uh, that means that we can't calculate um, an average. So there are two ways of dealing with this. Um, the first one is, 
before we do the summary, we can drop anything that has a missing value. So that's what this command does. I think we talked about it a little bit last time. So drop NA is an option. So if you use drop NA and then you put in a variable name, um, I will look at that variable and whenever there's a missing value in this variable, it'll delete the row. Um, and then we should be able to do this. So let's see, okay. And now we get some output. So that's one option. So that would be adding this drop missing values command and then pipe into the summarize call. That's one option. The other option is that in summarize, we can just add that um, as an argument. So we can add this um, na.rm, so na remove equals true. So that's just within the summarize command. Um, and that just tells R, just ignore anything that has NA. And if we run that, we get the exact same output. Okay, so two options, um, yeah. And it's just important to note with drop NA is that it does delete these rows completely. So if you were to continue working um, with this data frame afterwards or with the summary table afterwards, um, some rows would would be gone when you do drop in A generally, right? So drop in A is maybe something to be used with um, with caution, but it, it, it is an option. And as you can see here, R labels this automatically. So it gives us autom automatically um, a, a variable name, which is just mean height, or if we have this in A remove command or addition here, it, it adds that to the name of the column. Um, but we can change that. So if we want instead to call it average height, we can just add that. So here we have average height equals, and then this is the actual summary that we want R to do. Okay, and if I run this, we can see that it's now called average height. So we can change that if we want to. Okay, so on its own that, doesn't seem like the most useful thing. <laughs> After all, you could use something like um, base R summary or something like that. So that's, yeah, that doesn't seem super useful, but we'll make it um, really useful by adding another step before the summary. Um, and that step is called group by. So group by lets you do summary statistics for specific groups, for individual groups in the data. So Right now, what we're looking at is the average height for everything. So for all the data points, all the pieces of furniture in this IKEA data set. Um, but what we'll do in a second is look at um, price or other um, other information per different categories. So per, for, for example, are beds more expensive than tables or something like that. So the way this works is um, it's basically, it's usually a three-step um, process. So first we need to specify what the grouping variable is. So I'll just show this with this example. So here, our goal with this example here is to look at the average price per category, right? So the average price per furniture category instead of across the whole data set. So what we need to do first is we need to use group by and then R needs to know what the grouping variable is. So group by what, and that's going to be category. And what that does is it says, do everything that follows separately per group, right? So do the summary, do that separately for each of these furniture categories. Okay, so we have group by the category, and then, because we're using the pipe, um, give us the mean price per category. And then this last um, step, so this is ungroup, um, and that just removes this grouping information. And for summarize, um, that's not as important. We're basically, we're introducing it here, so we're all getting used to um, typing it, because if you forget um, to ungroup, um, R might behave kind of weirdly if you continue working with the same data, and we'll have an example of that later. So ungroup removes that grouping information, right? So group by says, do everything that follows separately per group. Um, and ungroup then tells R, okay, now stop using that group, do everything again for the entire data set. 
Okay, so that was lots of talking. Let me actually run the command so you can see what it looks like. All right, so now we have the categories, so different types of furniture. Um, and then we have the average price for each of these categories. Okay, so before we just had the average price across the entire data, and now we have it um, separately for each of these groups. Okay, and again, we can give this um, a name. So here I'm calling it av price. <laughs> and um, we've seen that before, but there's also something new here, which is this round command. So I would like to round that. Um, and I can just wrap this round command across um, around mean price. Okay, so this looks a bit different now. All right, so this has now been rounded and it's, it has this name that I gave it. Okay, so compare that to, if we don't have these options, compare this to that. Okay, and we can also do other calculations. So if we want to directly convert the price to euros, uh, we, again, we're grouping this um, because again, we want it separately for each category. Um, we're calling it average price euro. And then we still have mean price, so the average price, and then we're multiplying it by 0.22 to convert to euros. Okay, so now this is euros. So you can do additional calculations or manipulations with this um, summary. And we can even continue working with it straight away. So here, this part is the same as above. So we're just creating um, the average price per category. Um, we're converting that to euros. And then this part is new. So we're piping this into an arrange call um, because we want to sort this from cheapest to most expensive category. So now you can see this is sorted by average price in euros. So you can see that on average, um, kids and kids furniture tends to be the cheapest, right? So on average 60 euros and 86 euros and wardrobes tend to be on average, the most expensive. Right, so you can continue working with this new column that you made in this, in your summary table. You can continue working with this using a range or other commands. And also, so we've been calculating the mean over and over again, but there are other options and, and you can also do several calculations at the same time. So what we're doing here is we're calculating again, mean price, but we're also looking at the standard deviation, right? So here we're also calculating the standard deviation in one step, right? So we're just listing this basically. So average price equals mean price and SD price equals SD price, right? And then we have these two columns, right? So now we have the price for each category along with the standard deviation. Okay, and what you can also do is group by more than one column. So we've grouped by just one uh, column, but you can also group by several. So here we're adding other colors. So is something available in other colors or not? We're adding that to our group by call. And then again, we're calculating the mean price. But as you can see here, we now have the average price for here bar furniture if other col colors are not available and bar furniture if other colors are available. Right. So you could see if maybe if other colors are available, maybe that makes um, the price go up a little bit, <laughs> right? So you can group here, we're grouping by these two um, categories um, and then these further calculations, so mean or whatever else we want to do are done separately, are broken down by, can be broken down by several groups. Okay, so We've been working with um, numeric um, columns, so price mostly, or also height or any of the other dimensions. So these are numbers, these are numeric um, columns, but we can also do summaries for categorical data. 
And in that case, instead of using um, summarize, because things like mean and um, standard deviation and so on don't really make sense for categorical data, um, we have to use a different command. So we have to use count instead of summarize. So what we're doing here is we want to know, okay, how many beds and how many tables and how many children's furniture items do we have in this data set? So we're again grouping by category and then we're using count. And here I will just give us, it'll just count, okay, I found 208 beds in this data frame, uh, 481 chairs and so on. And you'll see that it calls this new column N, right? So this is just called N. And we can use that like we've been doing before. We can again use a range um, to show, okay, what is, what is actually the most frequent column here? We want to see that first. So we can use a range. Um, and here we're sorting by this N, so by the count. And we're doing that in descending order. Okay, so we can see that we have um, tables and desks. That's our most frequent category in this data set. Uh, and room dividers, yeah, kind of unsurprisingly, I guess, um, are the least frequent category. And we only have 13 of those in the data. And just to show this grouping by several variables, um, again, we can do, again, grouping by several variables. So we can check, okay, how, how many items are available per category? Um, and also broken down by whether there is another color available or not. All right, so similar to before, here we have, okay, bar furniture, um, which is not available in other colors, that's 42 pieces, and that is available in other colors, that's just five. Okay, so again, we can group by several variables. Oh yeah, and we've already yeah we've already talked a little bit about um, distinct, but you can also combine this. So if you group by um, category first, you can look at the distinct um, item names per category, for example. Okay, and here we've just um, listed all the things that you can do within summarize. So instead of mean, um, you can do standard deviation, which we've seen. Uh, you can do the interquartile range, which contains 50% of the data. Um, you have things like min and max, right? So we've just kind of listed um, everything you can, you can do there, but probably mean and, and standard deviation are among the most common things you could, you could do with that. Yes. So as a last um, topic, um, just a quick one, because um, <laughs> we're running out of time. Um, we want to look at what else we can use group by with. So um, we've been using group by as um, a helper or in combination with um, summarize a lot today. And that probably is the most common way that you would use group by, um, but you can combine it with um, mutate and, and also filter and we'll have a few examples. Um, so here we're going to combine it with filter first. We'll see a few examples um, of that. So let's say, so back to our IKEA data, we want to look at each category separately and we want to look at um, the most expensive items per group and specifically the five most expensive items per category. So the five most expensive chairs, five most expensive um, room dividers and so on. So what we can do here is group by category. And then we have a filter command that actually sorts everything per category. So separately for each category, the pieces of furniture are sorted um, by price in descending order. So for each category, the highest priced items are sorted first. And then we're wrapping this um, call in rank. So rank just, just assigns rank. So the um, first item, so the most exp um, expensive item gets a one, second most expensive item gets a two and so on. So we're using that to filter to say, show items that have um, a rank of five or smaller, right? So that would be the five most expensive items. And because we're grouping, this is happening separately for each group. 
Okay. So here you would see, maybe I should um, select also the, the name. Okay. So now we can see the most expensive um, beds, for example, are these five. Okay, so that, that's group by and filter. And um, we can also uh, do a quick summary. So let's say we only want um, categories that have more than 400 entries. Then we could use a filter that says N uh, is bigger than 400, right? And we want that filter to look at the categories grouped. So that's why we're adding this group by category first. And here we can also um, have a look at what happens if we forget to use this ungroup. So let's say we're doing this, we want to reduce our data set, we want to get rid of that, and then we also want to remove the category variable. So we would want to do select minus category. Um, so let's do that. And we can see that category is still here. And if we look at the warning, R tells us that it's adding a missing grouping variable. So we've forgotten to do ungroup, right? We have no ungroup here. And what that means is, so what can happen here is if you don't have an ungroup, um, then you can't remove the, the grouping variable, right? R won't let you because it thinks, well, this is a grouping variable, this is important. Uh, I can't just remove that. And what could also happen, which we're not showing right now, but what could also happen is that you, if you forget to ungroup, then R will of course continue to do everything group by group. And maybe you don't want that. Maybe you want to move on to doing something again for the whole data set. So it's important to remember this ungroup and then uh, this select should work, right? So now category is gone. And it didn't complain because we have an ungroup. Right, so for summaries, ungroup is not as important. Um, nothing should really break if you forget it, but um, if you continue working with the data in some way, uh, it's a good idea to have an ungroup. Okay, and the second uh, quick example is a group by in combination with mutate. So um, what we'll do, so first we'll just look at a simple example with just mutate, um, nothing grouped so far. What we'd like to do is we want to look at the price, so we'll just use price in euros um, for this one, but you could also use the, the other price variable. And we, instead of having the raw number, just the raw price, instead of that, we would like uh, the price to be expressed as a deviation from the average. So the average is around 237 um, euros, and we would like um, each uh, the price of each piece of furniture, we would like um, the mean to be subtracted from that, right? So I'll just show you what happens when we do that. So you can see that this new column, so price underscore C that we created, we have some negative numbers here, and we have some positive numbers, right? So we have a positive number here, and here and the rest is negative. And what this column contains now is the difference between this number and the average price, right? So because we did the price minus the average price. And if you're familiar with um, kind of statistics and um, data preparation for many models, this is what you would call centering, centering a variable. So instead of using um, the raw number, we could look at the deviation. So how, how far away is each number from the average? Okay. Um, and this is something that you, that you would want to do for um, some models. Okay, so that's centering. Um, and to combine that with groups. So right now what we're doing is we're looking at the price um, at the average price across the entire data set because there's no group by in here. This is just to explain what centering this variable means, what we're doing here. And we could now with a group by, we could do it separately for each group. Okay, so what, what we're doing here is um, this new variable that we're creating, this will show us um, which um, furniture items in each category uh, have a lower price than average or have a higher price than average and how much higher and how much lower, right? So I'll just do this part. Okay, 
So this new column, so you can see, so for bar furniture, and you can see that this uh, frequency, or how are you, <laughs> you're supposed to pronounce it, um, has a lower price than the average piece of bar furniture, right? Whereas the second one has a higher price. Okay, so that's 69 euros more expensive than the average. Okay, and we could also, again, we could pipe this into an arrange call to see, um, so here we have some wardrobes that are much, much cheaper than the average wardrobe would be. And here we have some sofas and so on that are much cheaper than, than the average price for a sofa would be, okay? So if you're looking for a, a cheap piece of furniture, that might be a nice trick to try, okay. Thanks for joining us again. And we will see you guys all again um, in April or stop by for our toolbox series that'll also be coming up in April. So thanks for joining, yeah.